Thank you all for joining. We're going to get started in just a few minutes as we allow the call to populate. Good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to get started in a few minutes as we allow the call to populate. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Krause Augen Brown, and I am the Legislative Director of ADL New England. I am glad to welcome you all here today for this important conversation about disinformation and its impact on democracy. Throughout the call, please ask any questions that you might have for our speaker through the Q&A function, and we will answer as many as we can in our question and answer period at the end of the call. I would now like to turn things over to Robin Steinberg, co-chair of the ADL New England Civil Rights Committee to introduce our speakers. Thank everybody for coming and joining us for this very important topic. I'm going to first introduce um, the Vice President of Civil Rights and Director of Legal Affairs, Steve Friedman. Steve provides direction and oversight for ADL's core work on civil rights, including countering anti-Semitism and hate, fighting bigotry and discrimination, safeguarding religious freedom and the separation of church and state, and promoting immigrant and refugee rights. Steve joined ADL as Assistant Director of Legal Affairs in 1985, and for over three decades has coordinated the preparation of more than 300 amicus curiae briefs submitted to the United States Supreme Court and various appellate courts throughout the country. Prior to joining ADL, Steve served as director of special projects for the Greater New York Conference on Soviet Jewry and a staff attorney as the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, now Human Rights First. Steve is a graduate of Yale University and Stanford Law School. We also welcome Lee McIntyre, research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, formerly executive director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. Lee McIntyre is the best selling author of Post Truth in 2018, which was named a CNN Book of the Week Award and PBS Best Book of 2018. 
along with numerous other works, including The Scientific Attitude in 2019 and How to Talk to a Science Denier in 2021. His popular essays have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Baltimore Sun, Nature, Newsweek, The Scientific American, and many others. McIntyre has appeared on CNN, PBS, NPR, and the BBC, and has spoken at the United Nations and the Vatican. Gentlemen, welcome. Floor is now yours. Thank you very, thank you very much. much, Robin. Uh, and thank you to all who've joined us and are participating. I wanna start by saying it's a real privilege for me to have the opportunity to have this conversation with our distinguished guest, Lee McIntyre, and I hope it's everybody finds it uh, educational, instructive, useful, and thank you for, for joining. And thank you for your interest in ADL and interest in the subject. Um, Lee, it's a pleasure. I'm gonna start by the, the title of this program today is Fact or Fiction, How Disinformation Impacts Our Democracy. But I think I'm gonna start with a basic question, which is, can you define for our audience what disinformation actually is? Yes, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having, here, uh, having me here today. It's an honor. Um, it's important in defining disinformation to think of what it's normally, uh, its contrast, which is misinformation, because you hear people confusing the two. Uh, misinformation is a mistake. Misinformation is um, when it's an accident. You know, suppose somebody hears something and they think that it might be true and then they go ahead and share it with other people uh, falsely. And so they're spreading false information, but they don't, uh, and they you know, think that it might be true, but they're not doing so um, knowing that it's false, okay? So that's misinformation. Disinformation is more insidious. Uh, disinformation is a lie. Uh, there's an intentional component to disinformation. So it's when somebody intentionally creates a falsehood and shares it for whatever reason, because usually because it serves their interest to have people believe that falsehood. So the, and that can lead to real problems, right? Because if we mischaracterize the two and suppose, you know, suppose something comes to us as disinformation, so it's a lie. Um, but if we think of it as misinformation, then we might feel helpless. We might feel, well, this is just like a natural disaster, you know, or, a, or an accident. There's nothing we can do about it. But uh, in most cases, that's not true. You have some examples you can share of, of disinformation, just to make that clear. Yeah, I think that maybe the best example that I can think of, of uh, to make that clear, comes from our recent experience with COVID. So. Some people, uh, so you know, as is well known, uh, there are many people who didn't get the COVID vaccine because they heard all sorts of uh, rumors and falsehoods uh, about it. Uh, one of those falsehoods was the idea that the COVID vaccine would contain uh, uh, biometric uh, uh, data, uh, uh, tracking chips. Um, now, that's a ridiculous idea. And most people spread it, not knowing whether it was true or not, you know, because they were worried about it. They spread it as misinformation. But that was actually disinformation because it started with a lie. And uh, what many people don't know, though it was in the Wall Street Journal and, and other reputable outlets, is that that story was invented by uh, Russian intelligence uh, way back, um, even you know, before the COVID lockdowns. Um, the story about the biometric microchips in the COVID vaccines appeared in an edition of a publication called the Oriental Review, which is an English language propaganda arm of the, uh, of the GRU. And it was this, this appeared in April, 2020. Now think about what was going on in April, 2020. We'd had the COVID lockdown but there were no COVID vaccines yet. And it told all these lies about the COVID vaccine. At the bottom, it said share on Twitter, share on Facebook, which people did. Uh, by May 2020, 44% of, of voters in the Republican party thought that that might be true. So there's an example, that's disinformation. It wasn't a mistake, it was a lie. You mentioned Twitter and Facebook. Can you say a word about the role of social media in spreading this information? Yeah, it's, um, it's the accelerant. Uh, I mean, um, 
uh, liars uh, have been around for a long time. Um, the idea of disinformation has been around for a long time. Uh, propaganda, if you want to think of it that way. Um, what the internet does is that it enables the liars to have a microphone. Um, that's not to say that everybody at the uh, you know at, at Facebook and Twitter are um, responsible for this. You know that they're doing it knowingly, but they are providing a platform for bad information to go forward, um, and that is a very dangerous thing. So I think that one of the reasons why our recent experience with this you know has been so horrific is that the platforms for disinformation uh, are now you know, so so virulent i mean you, you don't have to spread propaganda leaflets by dropping them from airplanes anymore you can just go to the internet you don't have to you know buy ads in newspapers you can go to the internet it's been just uh, a, a the internet is a terrific way to get the truth out there. It's also a terrific way to get lies out there. Let me probe a little more on that. You said the what, how about the why? Why do you think this is, why do you think social media companies are, are allowing this? Why do you think, um, what, well, two questions. What's motivating the people behind it? And then what's motivating the, the companies that are allowing it to spread so, so readily? Well, what's motivating the people behind it is, is simple. They want something. You know, they, they have a goal. Um, in the case of um, the, the uh, disinformation about the COVID vaccine, uh, it was a goal of Vladimir Putin to have the Sputnik V, the, uh, the Russian vaccine, be the, the dominant one in the world market. So there was an economic goal, but there was also an ideological goal. So, you know, when, when people lie, when they spread disinformation, it's because they want something. Um, now, it's important to remember the goal of disinformation is not simply to try to get you to believe a falsehood. It's also to polarize you, to break you into camps, uh, to, to teams, tribes, so that you think that people on the other side are not just misinformed, they're liars, they're awful people. Maybe you should even, uh, maybe you should even hate them. Uh, the, another goal of disinformation is to make you cynical, to make you feel like, well, I don't even, how does anybody even know what's true? So I guess the only place I can rely on truthful information is from the people in my team. That's who I'll turn to. That's where I'll get my information from. So disinformation is you know, an intentional campaign to mislead people and to polarize them around the interests of the person who's creating the disinformation. Now, the, the motivation with the social media companies is money. Um, they're, they're making a lot of money. I mean, when people are so misinformed and worried and they're engaged, and if you look at the algorithms for the uh, main social media companies, they're uh, set up for engagement, not for truth. I mean, they do put disclaimers on when forced to uh, about bad information. So, you know, they, they make some effort to fight it, but for the most part, they're making a profit, just as the cable news companies made profit from uh, playing Trump's speeches uh, start to finish with no commercial interruption and no commentary. Um, there is money to be made by giving that microphone to liars. So that suggests a couple of different questions, but let me ask you first, why do you think people are predisposed to believe something that is demonstrably not true? They want to. I mean, uh, 50, 60 years of social psychology have shown us that, you know, if somebody can exploit pre-existing desires to believe something and then make up a falsehood about it, we're more likely to believe it. Sometimes called uh, confirmation bias, the more technical term behind it is motivated reasoning. We sort of are looking for information that helps us to believe what we already uh, want to believe. The other thing to remember is that, um, as I said, one of the goals of the disinformers is to polarize us. And so when you not only believe something, but you see other people that you trust who believe it, that's a very strong signal that what you're believing maybe you think is true. Um, there is great belief is social. And you know, a good part of uh, what the disinformers are doing is eroding trust. 
who do you trust? The people around you, the people who have the same ideology and values that you do. And so uh, falsehood just comes along for the ride. It's a, it's a scary thing. And I've seen it mostly in my study of science deniers, people who believe that the, the earth is flat. Uh, why would anybody believe that? They believe it because it's what the people around them that they trust believe. So obviously it goes to who they see as authority figures as well, and not just the people around them. But That's right. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, disinformation is one of the main tactics of authoritarianism. Um, if you can control the information flow, you can control the population. I think, I mean, people are used to dismissing Donald Trump as a buffoon, and in many ways he is, but he is a master at disinformation. He understood, maybe in a feral way, in an instinctive way, how to control information flow and how to exploit people's pre existing fears so that even if he was unreliable, they were so afraid that they would uh, they would trust him maybe because other people on their team trusted him as well that's a great segue because i want to talk a little bit about the impact of disinformation on democracy mm -hmm. so so let me just sort of start with it how is disinformation how do you see it affecting democracy when it comes to voting when it comes to democratic initiatives more broadly yeah i think there's a straight line um if you look at uh, it, it, the historian, the, the uh, uh, Holocaust historian, uh, Timothy Snyder, who wrote the book On Tyranny, one of my favorite books, he said it best, post-truth is pre-fascism. If you can get people to give up on the idea of truth, that is not just to believe a falsehood, but to become so cynical that they're willing to subordinate reality to their political ideologies, you know, to, to believe what the dear leader says, then you can get them to do anything. And, th and that's what the authoritarian wants, right? One, one goal of disinformation is economic, but other goals are economic or political. And in my, my book, Post-Truth, I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality. Think back to what the cigarette companies were doing in the 50s when they were pretending that it was an open scientific question whether cigarette smoking caused cancer. They did that because they wanted to sell cigarettes. Um, now, but ask why did Trump do all the things that he did about election denial and, and even some of his, his earlier things that he did. He did it because it served his political interests. So post-truth, the term that you, that, that you title your book is a kind of disinformation, but there, there are other kinds of disinformation as well. Is that what you're saying? Um, post-truth, uh, yeah. So I, I define post-truth, as I said, as the political subordination of reality. Disinformation is a tactic. Okay. okay, disinformation is is a means. There are there are other means to achieve the the post truth goal. Um, some people have misunderstood what post truth means. Post truth doesn't mean that truth doesn't matter anymore. It means that truth is endangered. So when I say we live in a post truth era, that doesn't mean that that truth has no value. It means that for many people, truth is not their main value. Their main value is political power or political ideology. So they're willing to subordinate things that are true to what they want, which is for their party to be in power, for their ideology uh, to be ascendant. How does that happen? Through disinformation, through propaganda. Uh, Jason Stanley wrote a terrific book. He's written many terrific books. The one I'm thinking here of is How Propaganda Works. He wrote it also one later called How Fascism Works, both really important. So let me... In terms of the in terms of democracy, let me ask you to distinguish for a minute between the actual process of voting and disinformation mm -hmm. about things like when the polls open or when early voting starts or where you can go to vote. Sort of the practical questions that we heard some examples of people being decided yeah. about where to go and and you know and how to register and stuff like that from the actual misinformation disinformation about you know a position on an issue. Um, it's it's but, a it's a great question because there's some some subtlety here. Um, I think of voting as the end of the disinformation pipeline. It's the last thing, right? Because if you've done your propaganda right, 
the votes are going to go your way. There's, there's, you know, you don't need to resort to those amateur tactics of, you know, sending out uh, uh, memes that say, you know, Republicans vote on Tuesday, Democrats vote on Wednesday. You know, I mean, those those are amateur things. Some, I suppose, sometimes they work. People are gullible enough, but you know, the goal is to get people so polarized and so upset and so ensconced in their false beliefs that they can't wait to vote that, that they're they're just you know they're they're uh, gnashing their teeth to go to the polls and vote for the person that they want now there's a lot of lying around voting you know we see it with <laughs> the big lie right because but that's that's all part of the propaganda machine but i mean if we think of disinformation as a threat to democracy because the disinformation is about voting I think we've made a huge mistake. That's only the tip of the iceberg, right? The disinformation is about um, Black Lives Matter. It's about crime. It's about immigration. It's about everything because that's what motivates people to vote. So is there disinformation about voting? Yes, there is. But that, that's a, a very small sliver of it and kind of the, the last minute stuff you know when you um sometimes you'll get i i worked for a campaign one time and they they warned us about um pollsters who would something called a a push poll where the goal wasn't to take a poll it was to get you to vote for their candidate you know so they would start off with a question about um you know and this was usually a couple of days before the election they'd start off with something like you know who do you prefer in this uh in this race and you know they'd list off the candidates, and they'd say, you know, if we told you that candidate X had an uh, had a felony arrest ten years ago, would that change your point of view? I mean, obviously they're doing that to try to. That's a push poll. They're you know they're they're trying to spread disinformation to get you not to vote for that candidate. That's that's rookie stuff compared to the, the other you know the larger campaigns. So, when you speak about the larger campaigns. Um, Let's pull back a little bit. How much of sure. this? How much of the? How many of these campaigns do you think are systemic, sort of planned out in a strategy over a period of time? We're going to do this, yeah. and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. And how much of what we're seeing is sort of a, you know, there's there's something something unfortunate news development for a candidate that comes out, and that candidate decides to try to what we might have called in the past spin, but now maybe it's something a little more like you no know, disinformation. Yeah. And, so where's where is the where is the distinction yeah. between big picture campaigning and the it's like I, in the heat of the moment I'm going to tell tell a lie and stick with it kind of uh, approach? Yeah, sp spinning spin doctoring is kind of telling the most the version of the truth that's the most favorable to your candidate. So I mean that's dishonest, but it's not quite disinformation or or post truth. What I'm talking about here, I guess, are the um, the larger issues, um, some of which come out of foreign uh, uh, governments, and I'm not just talking about 2016, um, when they're, you know, engaging in disinformation warfare, uh, the Russians have been engaging in disinformation in information warfare against the United States for decades, uh, largely about scientific issues, which is quite interesting. I mentioned the COVID example. There are others about HIV AIDS, about GMOs, about climate change. They've, they've been assaulting our trust in science for quite some time. And I think that in some ways that provided a model for what they did with the 2016 election. Now, really good disinformation isn't just to make up a lie out of whole cloth and then try to sell it, though sometimes that happens. The best kind of disinformation is something where they take a kernel of truth and pervert it so that when the person denies it, they they look bad, you know, so they'll they'll take something. Let me think of a, a, of a good example here. You know, they'll, they'll take something where. Um, again, just to come back to the example of COVID, uh, maybe they'll take a, uh, you know, one case. That they that's you know been in the media about a person who got a COVID vaccine and then you know died from it, and then 
the disinformation campaign begins because then they can say, well, you know, there are 50,000 cases of this that the government is covering up. And then, well, then the, you're playing defense, right? Because there was one case and they'll keep coming back. Well, well do, but why did you delay telling us about that one case? You know, talking to the government now, why did you delay? Well, if you were lying about that, couldn't you be lying about this other one? So really good disinformation is opportunistic. What the, uh, the Russian troll farms did in the 2016 election is they monitored social media. They looked at, you know, where were the fault lines in American society and began to try to widen those cracks. So was there feeling, uh, some feeling amongst people in Texas that, you know, they didn't like the way the rest of the country was going and maybe they should secede from the union? Yes. But then that whole campaign that was started online, I, I forget what it was even called, the Secede Texas or whatever it was called, that was pure invention from, from the Russians. Same thing happened with um, a lot of the uh, Black Lives Matter um, uh, controversy at the time, uh, where you know, they would exploit uh, fear of what Black Lives Matter uh, stood for. I'll give you another example. This one is, this one is, is much sadder. Some of the, and I, I will, uh, th this will shock some people, but it's not controversial. You can, you can read up on it. Some of the disinformation shared in the 2016 primary uh, of the controversy, the, the enmity between uh, Sanders and Clinton was a result of Russian intelligence. They understood that if they could say, if they could get things out, you know, memes and jokes and other things to say, well, you know, that Clinton was being unfair to Sanders that that would keep Sanders voters home. So, you know, so a lot of people who were, you know, great Bernie supporters and just ticked off, uh, they were ticked off because they were puppets of Russian propaganda. So you've mentioned Russia several times, uh, probably in the context of this conversation, it makes sense to ask about what's going on now with uh, Ukraine yeah. and what I guess a massive disinformation campaign yeah. internally in Russia. Yeah. Uh, how do you see, and this is a case of, of a government, like as a concerted policy, I guess, purveying this information. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment? It, it, it is. Uh, the Russians invented modern information warfare in the 1920s. Uh, Dzerzhensky was uh, Lenin's uh, uh, first information minister. I think he was head of the Cheka back in 1920. And his goal was to spread falsehoods about the, um, the, the resistance to the Russian Revolution. And that's where they developed a lot of the tactics that then became part of the Soviet playbook and are you know, still part of the, of the Russian playbook. So the reason I come back to Russia is because they're masters at this. They really uh, invented this. And so it's not surprising that, that they use it um, and they use it in the, the war in Ukraine. Um, what were some of the first things that they did before they even invaded? They tried to sneak in um, and do a, 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 a video, a, a propaganda video, showing allegedly uh, Ukrainians committing atrocities against Russians on Ukrainian soil that would be a pretext for them coming in and invading. And I don't know if everybody remembers, but uh, the Biden administration handled that brilliantly. They exposed it. Jen Psaki went out there and said, look, we have intelligence that tells us that the Russians are gonna try this. Here's what they're gonna say. Here's what they're going to do, and so when they actually made that video, it fell flat. Its uh, its um, propaganda value was taken away because it was flagged in advance. By the way, that's a very good way to fight this information. You pre-bunk it. You get out there ahead of the lie and show they're going to tell a lie. Um, this is uh, so. I'm a member. I'm a, a board member of a group, uh, a think tank now called Circe, the Cognitive Immun Immunology Research Collaborative, where we're working with some scholars around the world on how to develop this uh, this idea, and we're you know we're trying to uh, uh, spread this because it, it is a it is one of the best ways to fight this information. I, I had never heard the term pre-bunk before, but pre I kind of like it. But you can kind of imagine what it <laughs> yeah. means. Sir. Let's pivot to talk about what we can do about all of this. Um, both, yeah. I think, as a society, you know, in, as individuals, for ADLs, organization, for groups that are that are concerned about the impact that this yeah. information is having. What, sure. What do you have to say about that? As a society, you know, in uh, I'll talk about the U.S. 
Look, um, we know how to fight an information war. Our, our, our military, our intelligence services, we know how to fight an information war. But the problem is that most people today, American citizens don't realize that we're in an information war. So when you talk about societal things that we can do, we're really dependent on government. And I think that most of our people in Congress don't understand that we're in an information war. Are there things that they could do? Yes, they could regulate uh, the social media companies uh, you know, better than they have. They, they frame it as an issue. They had a, a, a hearing uh, not long ago about this uh, in which one of the senators said, well, you know, we're, we're, we're very far down uh, from talking about regulating social media companies. And yet that's exactly what they should be thinking of in my, in my opinion, because you know, the algorithms are secret. Um, there's no transparency around them. Um, you know, should they be, uh, you know, thinking about the, the rule which allows social media companies to spread whatever they want and not be responsible for fa false content? Yes, they should be looking at that and other things as well. So there are societal things that we can do. I just pointed out, now that's a, an example where we failed. Um, what the Biden administration did recently by appointing a disinformation czar at the Homeland Security was great. The rollout was terrible. And in fact, I just heard that it was, this was put on pause and their director, Nina Jankowitz, who's, who's a world expert on disinformation. Uh, I don't know if she's gonna be a part of it anymore, which is a tragedy. How did a board, which was devoted to fighting disinformation, get taken down by disinformation? That's what happened with them. So, I mean, so that's kind of a, a tragedy too. So at the societal level, we have really got our work cut out for us in terms of what to do, which can make ordinary citizens feel helpless. Don't, don't feel helpless because I'll give you some very practical steps of what we can do. I've interviewed uh, people in the US military. I've interviewed uh, folks in the FBI, uh, different places about and ask them this question. What can we learn from information warfare? What could we be doing as ordinary citizens? And the answers are really quite simple. Tell the truth, tell it over and over again, and have more than one people, more than one person spreading the message of truth, especially to members of the community that they're in, right? If you're trying to reach somebody within a particular community, choose a messenger from within that community. The one thing that frustrates me is when I see people say, oh, well, this person's not listening to facts. Listen to all that falsehood. I guess I just can't talk to them. Wrong. The repetition effect works for falsehood. It also works for truth. And, you know, to give up, to say, well, these people aren't worth talking to. I might as well not even bother, means that the only thing that anybody hears is falsehood. You know, they're, they're not hearing the truth. I think another thing that happens as individuals is we think, well, it's impolite to correct somebody. Uh, no, you're telling them the truth, and the truth is a valuable thing. We have this reflex sometimes, people who are well brought up, that you don't contradict somebody. You don't get in their face. And, you know, people have different comfort levels with this, I understand. But you, I remember that phrase uh, about uh, we agree to disagree. You do not have to agree to disagree when it's on a factual matter. When it's on a values or ideology matter, or, or, or you know, a values matter, maybe you want to agree to disagree. I never agree to disagree on a factual matter. I went to a convention with 650 flat earthers there. I didn't agree to disagree about the shape of the earth. That is not how you combat disinformation. I heard you mention something called the truth sandwich. Do you want to say a word about what that yeah. is? Yeah, I didn't come up with this. This was George Lakoff, who is a, a brilliant uh, psychologist. One of the very best um, ways to fight disinformation is to remember that when you're about to spread, a, when you're about to mention a falsehood, even to say that it's false, you have to remember that the thing that the person's going to remember is the message. Right. So if, if you're going to say there are no ghosts, then the person's going to think, are there ghosts? 
So the truth sandwich tries to combat that by putting the false message in a sandwich of truth. The proper way to report on something like that is uh, there are no ghosts. They think there's some evidence from you know, such and such source showing that they're ghosts, but it turns out to be false for the following reasons. This, you know, this is why they did it, to reiterate, there are no ghosts. Now, I did that in a very ham-fisted way, but the point is that you see news commentators do it the wrong way all the time. You know, you'll hear them say, um, you know, uh, um, Republicans concerned about, you know, the crime rate in such and such city, even when the crime rate in that city has been going down. But then the message is, oh, is the crime rate going up? That's false. They, they should report it, you know, in the appropriate way. They, they, this happened with Trump all the time. They did, the, and many people in the media did not learn the lesson. They didn't even call him a liar for a long time. They did not learn the lesson. You have to, if you're going to report on a false statement, you have to encapsulate it, sandwich it in two truths. And how do you, in terms of challenges of scale in responding to disinformation, and we talked about social media platforms before, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you address, the, I mean, it's one thing to be able to talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and say, I'm not going to agree to disagree on, because this is a factual question. Yeah. But how do, you, how do you deal with it when it's such a big global wide kind of problem on some of these issues. Yeah, we, we need a lot of, that's why we need a lot of people doing it. We need an army of people out there. Um, I mean, everybody should grab an oar and row. Everybody should do what they can. I, I personally um, try to get to as many people as I can, but there is of course a cap. <laughs> I mean, this is why I'm a writer. As an author, I feel like I can get to people. I feel like sometimes, most of my audience are people who already agree with me, but if I can empower them to get out and uh, talk to others, then maybe I've done a uh, done a good thing. But you know, we we just we need to not we need look we need to not let people get away with lying, especially lying about something that's important to all of us. And you how know, do you we, respond? We, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought. I, I would. I don't remember it. Go ahead. Not, you said we need to let people not get away with lying. But I was going to ask about somebody who pushes back and says, well, First Amendment, you know, you can say whatever you want or think whatever you want, whether it's true or not. We believe in freedom of speech in this country. How do you respond to that? I, I believe in freedom of speech. But as we all know, freedom of speech doesn't give you the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. And saying that Biden stole the 2020 election is the political equivalent of yelling fire in a crowded theater. It has real world consequences like January 6. People die as a result of lies like that. So, and it's also important to remember that freedom of speech is guaranteed under the Constitution not to be eroded by the government, not private corporations. So, Twitter and Facebook could deplatform anybody they want. And in fact, that's the best possible thing to do with a liar is to deplatform them. You don't hand a microphone to a liar. That's just complicit, right? So, I mean, once researchers have shown that once somebody hears a lie, they're more likely to believe it. So what's the best possible way to fight this information? Don't let them hear it. Find a way to, you know, if you can't, better even than pre-bunking it, is silencing it before they get a chance to get out there. Now, of course, some folks complain, oh, but what we need is radical freedom of speech. Here's why I think we don't. Well-meaning people like Barack Obama once claimed that the best possible thing we need is more speech because with more speech, with more people involved in the debate, the truth will rise to the top. It does not. It, we've seen this in the internet, you know, we, we've seen this in the comment section on any article that's got the least political bite to it. Uh, the truth does not rise to the top. The lies and partis partisanship rise to the top. Obama gave a speech recently in which he more or less gave a mea culpa and admitted that he did not do enough to fight this information during his uh, uh, time in office. And it's because he underestimated it. And the reason he underestimated it was because he believed this myth that what we really need is more speech. We do not need 
uh, to empower liars. Um, pe people, people talk about freedom of speech with the reverence as if, well, what that means is we need to give unfettered, unfiltered, universal access to, you know, to the greatest megaphone in the world, to any liar that wants it. We wouldn't do that for anything else. I mean, even if you believe, you know, very strongly in freedom of speech, people, you know, should have a right to march, even if you don't agree with their cause. Are you going to help them hand out flyers for their event? You are not, right? If you disagree with their cause, you are allowed to dissent, to push back loudly when you disagree, especially on a matter of fact. I'm going to ask, um, well, two, two related questions, <laughs> and that we, then we'll open it up for questions from the, from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask about your prognosis for the future, and related to that, how we do a better job of teaching critical thinking, particularly children, because I think those two are very much intertwined. We need to under, we need to tell people how to understand the difference between yeah. something that's true and something that's not. And and given the plague of disinformation that we're out there, what's your prognosis? How, where do you see this going? The the I think we should teach critical thinking early. Uh, I taught logic to a fifth grade class one time and they loved it. I mean, little kids can learn critical thinking. The best book I know uh, on critical thinking is by my, uh, my very close friend who just passed away, uh, Jonathan Haber. It's called Critical Thinking and it's out with the MIT Press uh, Central Knowledge Series, same series that uh, my book Post Truth was in. Uh, John is a, a wonderful philosopher, wonderful thinker. And everyone could profit uh, from that uh, from that book. Prognosis for the future. I, I'm afraid I'm worried. I mean, I can tell you the things that we should do, but I'm I'm not going to offer much hope because the people who have the ability to do something right now are not doing it. And I think back to those early days of the Trump administration, what really worked was collective action, the Women's March. Everybody got out and, and pushed back. Everybody let Trump know, you're not going to get away with this. People went to the airports to you know, help the, uh, the immigrants who are, who are coming in, uh, the, you know, free legal services, et cetera. It's going to take grassroots collective action. Right now, people are really, I hate to say it, right now, most people are asleep. And you wouldn't think so because we're all watching CNN and MSNBC and freaking out. But most people are asleep to the fact that we're in an information war and that there's something that we can, that we can do about it. And the only way to fight an information war, the first step is to realize that you're in one. And I think that we need, so we all need to be involved. We all need to be doing something because unfortunately, and this is a dark prognosis, if the midterm elections result in the Republicans retaking the House, it may be game over. No matter what the electoral outcome in 2024, um, they might be able to do what they failed to do in 2020. That is install someone even though they didn't win either the popular or the electoral vote. Um, so that's, I mean, so we don't have time for the little kids to learn critical thinking. We need to uh, get out there and, uh, and, and push back more than we are. R uh, contact your cable TV outlet and tell them, why aren't you reporting on this story more? Um, contact the, the newspapers. Um, your uh, representatives in Washington. People need to be shouting this from the rooftops. It is it is very nearly too late to do anything about the midterm elections. Well, I have to say, of course, that ADL doesn't support or oppose any particular candidates for office. I understand, but I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I, but I think this has been, hopefully people who have been listening, well, if they're asleep, they won't stay asleep. Um, and with that, I, I thank you because this has been a, a pleasure. And I'm going to turn to Melissa to, to feed us, feed you some of the questions from, that thank have you. been accumulating in the chat. So thanks. Thanks very much. for the great questions. I appreciate it. My pleasure.
Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for moderating this discussion. It's really given us a lot to think about. And I think from the questions that we're seeing come in, you know, this is something that people really want to engage in. Um, one of the and, questions- and Let me just say, Steve, oh. I didn't mean to get you in trouble there at the end. I know you're a nonprofit, excuse me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lee. Um, one of the questions that came up is you, you spoke about how authoritarian regimes rely on disinformation. Do you have any thoughts on how long that kind of regime can last? Can that just go on indefinitely? Or is there a point when reality has to come in and disrupt it? I, I you know, it's, it's a great question because I, I think it's, I think it's harder now because you know the the internet giveth and taketh away, right? The, because the internet does allow people on their cell phones when maybe you know 20, 30 years ago they couldn't get it to, to see things that are that are true, you know, to have that, you know, the independent reporting leak through. But it can last a pretty long time. And I mean, there's still, and it, it's it's not just a question of the information getting through, it's having the political. Um, infrastructure in place to do something about it. I mean, there's a protest movement in Russia. Are they organized? What can they, how much can they do? What happens when their leaders are thrown in jail? I also think here of North Korea. They don't have a lot of correction from reality in North Korea. Um, they get <laughs> propaganda and they believe it because what else is there? Um, so that that can that can last a very long time. I mean, look, authoritarian regimes are usually leaky, you know, for information. That's why they crack down so hard. That's why they have censorship of the internet in China. That's why they throw people, uh, political prisoners, in jail in Russia, because truth is dangerous. I mean, and which is a great message for us to hear, right? You'd think, well, why does a dictator have to care? Why can't a dictator just say, I don't care what's true, you're gonna do what I say or I'll kill you. But they don't, do they? I mean, they, they do sometimes kill people, but they mostly want to get people to believe the falsehoods or if they can't believe the falsehoods, at least to be so cynical that they think that the truth can't be known. That was the point of Jason Stanley's book, How Propaganda Works. Propaganda, the main point is to show you who's boss. It's to intimidate you. So that's, you know, th that's important to remember. That's a great question though. I love that one. And your answer there brought up another question that was asked in the chat. You mentioned the, the protests that are going on in Russia. Do you see a kind of group collective action as being an effective way to combat disinformation? Or do you think that a lot of it has to happen on an individual kind of more personal scale? Or is there room for groups of people to come out and correct this? I, I think there's a relationship. I mean, uh, I use again, the example of the Women's March. How, how many cities was that in? Was it 600 more? I mean, a few indiv individuals took action, uh, designed the infrastructure. People were upset. They went. I went to the Women's March in Boston. I, I, you know, people went all over the world. Um, so, you know, it, it can. I mean, if people are looking to get involved, if they're looking for things that they can do, there, you know, there are things that they can do. The gra grassroots is. I mean, uh, look to go back to COVID there were grassroots efforts to get people to take their COVID vaccine that were quite effective. I remember reading a story in the Business Insider about four African-American women in Alabama who got hundreds of people in their community to take the, the COVID vaccine. There was a woman in, in uh, California who got something like 700 people single-handedly to take the COVID vaccine. So individuals can do a lot. It's better if they're organized. Um, how, another question that came in is how do you manage those who reject your facts as being biased or who think you are brainwashed? How can you have that yeah. conversation when you're coming from yeah. kind of the same place on opposite ends? So I'm smiling because I had a searing experience with this exact thing. When in November, 2018, I walked into the ballroom of the Flat Earth International Conference. I disagreed with them and they disagreed with me. 
I thought they were brainwashed. They thought I was brainwashed. Yet we had civil conversations over the next 48 hours. And I wrote a book about it called How to Talk to a Science Denier. Because what I proved to myself was that it is possible to have civil conversations even when you disagree vehemently about the facts. And the way to do it is to be calm and respectful and to listen to what the other person has to say. Because that kind of deep-seated denial is about distrust. It's not about doubt. It's not about facts. It's about distrust and sometimes hatred if it gets that far. Um, but if you defang the snake, if you walk in and try to be calm and friendly and ask people why they believe what they believe, they will engage. My most effective question in that crowd was, um, what would it take to convince you that you were wrong? Now, that's not really a hostile question because I'm asking them something that they might think about. But there, I mean, there's an example. If, you, if this is a factual debate and they agreed that it was, um, what facts could I offer you to convince you? And then when they couldn't tell me what facts I could offer to convince them, that made them a little uncomfortable, or it should. So that I, I like that. I mean, I'm a philosopher, so of course I like that question. But um, that's, that's one way to do it. Look, if you're not out there talking to people who disagree with you, you could be doing more. You don't have to buy a ticket and go to the Flat Earth Convention like I did. But is it possible to talk with people who disagree with you? Yes, it is. Now, the trick is not to give that person a platform while you're doing so, okay? I would not agree to debate in public a flat earther because they would use that as propaganda. They, they, whether they won or lost the debate, they would use that as propaganda for their point of view. So I, I will not publicly debate them, but I would go talk to them on an individual basis. Absolutely. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in a similar vein, um, we had a, a question come in through the Q&A that what happens if you're bringing up this information that you know is true, but the other side then tries to bombard you with a lot of other information that you're not familiar with, they're citing mm -hmm. Sources that you don't regularly read, um, mm -hmm. and they're citing, you know, wherever they are getting this information from, you're not familiar with it. How can you effectively respond in that kind of situation? This happens to me three or four times a week. I heard you on the such and such show. You're dead wrong about climate change. Here are 14 things you need to read before you go to bed tonight. You're so misinformed. And then I'll pick one of the things to read. And then I'll come back with, because um, I do engage, I'll come back with, you know, well, this study was retracted or this study was, you know, done by somebody who got money, you know, a grant from Exxon Mobil, or, you know, something like that to discredit it. And if you do that in a respectful way, even which is possible, even through email or, or online, it's harder than doing it face to face. Um, sometimes you can make progress. I'm going to say that more often than not, that kind of thing with me online doesn't work, right? Because they're, by the time they're writing to me, they're wanting to humiliate me. They don't want to engage in a dialogue with me, though I've had some successful encounters where, and by success, I mean that we've listened to one another. I had one fellow who really um, disagreed with what I had said about whether GMOs were uh, dangerous to eat or not, uh, which was the topic in my book, How to Talk to a Science Denier. And he was very upset about this. And I challenged him to provide me with a study which showed that they were dangerous. And he sent me a study and I wrote back and said, but this study was rescinded. This study was not capable of being reproduced and, and it, it was rescinded. And, you know, it's, so we, we had a back and forth over this, but I mean, sometimes that happens uh, as well. So it is, it is possible to do that. You, you, have, to, you have to have patience. Uh, and sometimes I don't, uh, um, and you just have to try. And along those lines, are there steps that we can take to, whether on the individual level or collectively to improve 
media literacy and improve people's understanding so that when they see this kind of information, they know that they can't cite it and that it's unreliable? That's a tough one because part of a conspiracy theory is to cover up the fact that it's a conspiracy theory. You know, and so they will sometimes, you, you know, so you you see these um, things online of, you know, these are the reliable media sources, or these are the ones that are biased left and biased right, et cetera. And then somebody will say, but, but who came up with that? And, you know, that, that fact-checking organization was also biased. So that, you know, there's some difficulty there. I mean, one thing might be to get people to, you know, agree on basic I don't know. Uh, sometimes I try to get them to agree on basic statistics from like, well, isn't the FBI the best source for crime statistics because, you know, they actually track this, you know, um, and when we're looking at crime, really the crime we should be looking at is murder because murder is very hard to hide and it's almost always reported. So, you know, so let's look at what the FBI says when we're talking about the murder rate in certain cities, et cetera. And then, you know, if somebody comes back, well, well, you know, the FBI is a, a you know, fascist organization or the FBI is, um, you know, fill in the conspiracy, then there's not really a, a lot that, that you can say. But, you know, just again, to try to get people in advance to agree about what would count as evidence and maybe a reliable source for that evidence, if you can get them to do that, that would be, uh, that would be good. Otherwise, you're kind of wasting time. Um, you know, reading all 14 things that they sent you because they all say the same thing. Sure, thank you so much. Um, and I know that we are coming up to the end of the hour, but want to give you the final word here, particularly, you know, I know this is your line of work. Do you have any additional advice or things that you want the audience to take away from this conversation oh, today as we move forward? What a great opportunity, thank you. Yeah, to this group in particular, I'll say this. I think that one goal of disinformation is to get people to hate. When we disagree with someone, even over a factual matter, if we get polarized enough, we start to see the people on the other side as not just misinformed, but terrible people awful people, people who are our enemy and who we might even commit violence against. So I think that if you're committed to fighting hate, and I know that you are, the primary thing to remember is that by the time that, by the time it is metastasized into hate, it's very hard to convince someone to give it up. It starts with information and it starts with disinformation. And so anything that you can do to fight disinformation is going to help you with hate. I think that those things are intimately related. That is a great note to end on. And I wanna sincerely thank you and Steve for joining us here today. Um, I very much appreciate it and really enjoyed hearing this conversation and being able to engage with you on this topic. Um, and I wanna turn it over to Michael for some final words. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Melissa. Um, as we approach the end of the hour, uh, it's time to conclude the program. My name is Michael Loeb. I'm a regional board member for ADL in Connecticut. I'm also on a national commission. And this was an extremely important and timely conversation, given, given everything that's going on right now from uh, some shocking primary results to what happened in Buffalo, uh, to uh, the seeping into our politics of uh, religious nationalism, which is pretty scary. Uh, and I wanna really thank Lee and Steve for their time and expertise in leading us through these issues. Uh, it's clear now more than ever that it's crucial that we in ADL and, and any informed citizens uh, stay informed on the threat of disinformation because it is a real threat and uh, hopefully it's not too late, but we need to do everything that we can. And uh, all I can say is stay tuned for emails from your regional office about upcoming, upcoming programs and events. And um, on that light note, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>